Hello and welcome to the new Yankee Workshop, Season 1, Episode 7, The Trestle Table. After a look at a pine trestle table in a shaker house on the island of Nantucket off the Massachusetts coast, Norm constructs his own easily disassembled trestle table of a cherry, a hardwood which, if kiln dried, resists twisting or shrinking over time. Norm shows how to glue up the boards that comprise the expansive tabletop and demonstrates how to make the two trestles and the stretcher which connects them. Enjoy! Now this is it, an authentic Nantucket dining room. These white walls make everything stand out, like this corner cupboard and the nice big fireplace. But the thing that attracts me first is this table. It's made out of three pine boards and, oh, look at this. They put a Dutchman in there, which is a patch. It was probably made from some recycled material from a boat or maybe another old house. Let's take a look underneath. It's a trestle table. It has a nicely proportioned foot. Here's the vertical member of the trestle. And the stretcher comes through that and is held in place with this wooden wedge. Oh, and further down the line, they've added another brace here. And that's probably because the table is pretty thin and it needed some extra support for its length. The one thing that surprised me about this table, though, is that it's made out of pine, which is a softwood, and a dining room table would get a lot of nicks and dings. But this one's been beautifully cared for. The other thing that impresses me is the proportions. Narrow, yet very long, which probably means you could seat 10 people at this table comfortably. You know, I think I should take a few measurements, make some sketches, because this is something that we could build back at the shop. I suppose the most formidable task of building this table is edge gluing this top, because it's so big. And in fact, it's built out of six boards. You can see one, two, three, four, five, six boards. And I just couldn't find a way how to align and glue all these pieces and clamp them before the glue set up. So I broke it down into two groups, and I glued these up yesterday afternoon, each having three boards, and now I'm ready to join these two groups together. Okay, that's the easy part. Now comes the hard part. Setting these pieces down and aligning them and clamping them together, each group together, before the glue sets up. Now you notice when I do my clamping, I'm going to use some pieces, small scraps of wood so that I don't mar up the edges of my table. Okay, now this next clamp is going to go over the top. And I always alternate the clamps, one under, one over, about every two feet down the length of the tabletop. Okay, that looks pretty good. Now we'll just let it dry. One of the great things about a trestle table is that it can be easily disassembled. Okay, let's take a look at one of the trestles. You can see it's three pieces, a foot, a vertical member right here, and a brace on the top. Now the foot is attached to the vertical member by a mortise and tenon. The foot is made out of two pieces of wood, which will get glued together. And I suppose I could glue them up first and then cut that mortise through there for the tenon with uh, boring bits and chisels. But I'm going to do it before I do the glue up on the radial arm. And the radial arm is set up with a dado head, which is just two blades at an angle to one another, so they plow out material. And we can do this in just a few minutes. Watch. With the two pieces from my foot, dadoed, glued, and clamped together, I'm going to set it aside and turn my attention to this top brace, which also has a mortise that goes all the way through. But this time, I don't have an alternative. I do have to drill all the way through this piece of wood and chisel out the excess material. So I've laid out the area of the mortise on the top and on the bottom, because I need those lines as guidelines. And I'll bring them over to the drill press here, where I've installed a three-quarter inch forstner bit and this feather board. 
which helps hold the work tightly up against the fence so it won't move around as I bore it out. Now with the short bit, I'm going to have to bore through one side, turn it over, and finish the boring from the other side. Well, it really helps to have some sharp chisels when you're working with this hardwood. And now a little bit of work with a wood rasp, and that'll finish up the inside of this mortise. Okay, the next thing I want to do is turn my attention to this vertical piece. And because this piece is about 10 inches wide, I had to glue up a couple pieces of cherry because the widest I could get was about six and a half inches. And the first thing I want to do is make a tenon on the end of this piece, which goes through that top brace. And I'm going to do that to this piece right here, over on the radial arm saw, which again has the dado head in it. And I've set it up so that it'll remove about five sixteenths of an inch of material on each side of this vertical piece. Well, that takes care of the data wing for the top tenon. Now I need to make another one on the bottom here because there's a tenon that goes through the foot section, and it's a little bit thicker, so I'm going to have to readjust my radial arm, but the procedure is exactly the same. Well, the next thing I want to do is put a shoulder cut on these tenons, and that's to remove this piece of material so that I don't stand the chance of having a gap right along this edge. I suppose I could use a lot of different tools to do that job, but I prefer to do it on the bandsaw. You might have noticed that when I made this shoulder cut on the bandsaw that I left a little extra material on right here. And that was so that I wouldn't disturb this nice clean line down this side part. And I'm just removing the excess with a good sharp chisel. Well, now it's time to make this mortise right here, which is where the stretcher passes through to connect the two trestles. And I'll do that over on the drill press, which still has a three-quarter inch Forstner bit in it, and I'll just drill a series of holes to get that material out. Okay, now I'll just clean out this mortise with my chisels just like I did on the other one. Okay, the next thing I want to do is cut these angles on the brace, the top brace, which is 60 degrees, so it's a steep angle. And I'm going to do it over here on the table saw with my T-square, but if you find out that as you pull the T-square back to get started, it goes off the end of the table, so it's not very steady. So what I'm going to do is just turn it around, and that'll make it a lot easier and safer to make this cut. Well, now that the glue is set up on my foot assemblies, I'm ready to do some more work. And I made this template from the table down in Nantucket, and it gives me two things, the profile along the top of the leg and this little space underneath here. And that's there so that the table will rest on four smaller bearing points rather than just two long ones. I take my template and trace the outline of the pattern on each blank, and then I'll go over to my bandsaw and make the cuts. Well, a bandsaw does a real nice job cutting those curves, but they are still a little bit rough. So I've taken the chuck out of the drill press and replaced it with this drum sander, and that does a great job smoothing it out and squaring it up. Take a look. The next thing to do to the foot assemblies, now that they're all sanded, is to relieve the edges right here along the top. And to do that, I'm going to use a quarter inch rounding over bit, and I'll do both edges. The 
next thing I want to do is check how well this joint fits. I want it to be tight and I want it to be flush. So I'm just going to dry fit the two pieces together and that's, you don't want to glue it now, we'll try a dry fit. Okay, and see how it looks. Now that fits good this way, but it's sticking up a little bit here, so I'll just dress that up with my sander. Okay, with this piece nicely sanded smooth, I'm ready to put this decorative bead right down the edge here. And to do that, I'm going to have to pull it apart again. And come over to my table saw, which is now outfitted with a molding head cutter. And you can see there's a cutter mounted in a heavy base. And in fact, there's three of these on the entire system. But this bead, this cutter is set up for three beads, and I only need one. So I'm going to slide the fence over, covering two of the beads. And I've set a guide mark right here on my table. And I'll tighten that down and run my piece through on all four edges. <laughs> Well, it's glue up time. And I want to make sure that I get some good coverage right on these shoulders and cheek cuts of my tenon. So I've put the glue on with the glue bottle, and now I'm just using a brush to spread it out evenly. And then on the tenon itself, I'm going to use my little glue roller. And I want to get a fairly decent coverage on those, but I don't want to put so much glue on it that when I squeeze the two pieces together, it's all going to ooze out. Okay, with that clamp down, I can set it aside to dry overnight, but first I want to take a damp sponge and remove any excess glue because we want to make sure we do that now. Well, a little more rain here this morning in New England, but I guess we could use it. The trestles have been setting up overnight and I guess they're all set, but I'm going to leave them in the clamps for a little while and turn my attention to the rest of the assembly. And the first thing that I want to start working on is this stretcher. And I'll have to make some notches in the ends here where it passes through the hole in the trestle and it comes out with a little bit of a taper. And then also along the center of the trestle right here, I need to cut a mortise for this center brace. And also on this little top cross member, I also need another little mortise. Now the drill press still has its three quarter inch forstner bit in it and I'm just gonna drill a couple holes. Now this time I don't have to go all the way through. I only have to go down about an inch. Okay, now for this center brace, I slide it in behind my feather board. And this one I'm gonna to have to drill all the way through, but I'll drill from one side, turn it over, and then finish it. Now I'll clean out the rest of these two mortises with a good sharp chisel, just as before. And now I'm going to turn my attention to this tapered support in the center. And the first thing that I have to do is take my blank stock here and make a tenon on each end. And I'll do that with my radial arm, which is set up with a dado head cutter. Okay, that takes care of the tenons. Now we'll give them a trial fit. That one's pretty good. Now this top one. Okay, well now I can go over to the bandsaw and cut this tapered part right here, as well as these curves right along this top brace. Okay, that smooths out the edges of the tapered piece, and now since the beading bit is still in the saw, I'm going to bead the four edges. Well, one last beading operation, which is to our stretcher, and I'll do all four edges of that.
the shoulder cuts right here on the stretcher need to be precisely cut. Otherwise, when it's driven together, you won't have a nice fit right along this line, and the trestle won't be perfectly vertical. Now, you could cut it a lot of different ways, but since I have the radial arm here, I'm going to do it with that. Something. Set the fence up a little bit higher with this piece of plywood so that I have a good solid backing to make the cut. So I'll just slide it over and run the saw through. On the end of the stretcher piece, you can see by the layout lines that it goes straight for a ways, and that's where the trestle fits on. Then it's slightly tapered. Now, it's a heavy piece, so it's going to take some careful hand-eye coordination to get it through the saw. The trestle assembly is held together by means of wedges on either end. And note that it's straight on one side and tapered on this side. That's so it'll wedge in there tightly. It also means that I'm going to have to cut the mortise at a taper, at that five-degree taper. So I'll do that over on the drill press where I've been doing all the other mortising, except that I've added a piece of wood which has been cut at a five-degree angle, which gives me the right relationship to the drill press. So I'll drill one hole on each end. Now, the rest of the mortising will take place at just 90 degrees. Okay, that cleans up the mortises, and now I'm ready to make the wedges, which are half-inch stock, and I'll just hold a couple pieces together and cut them on the bandsaw. Well, that does a nice job rounding off these edges. I'm just using a quarter-inch rounding over bit in my router table. Now, I'll bring this over to our trestle assembly and see if it fits in there good. Okay, that's pretty good. And our centerpiece is all fit. And now just to tighten down this wedge. Now I'm ready for the top. Well, a circular saw with a board clamp down is a perfect way to square up this table. Now, on each end, I'm going to have to make a tongue, which will accept the breadboard edge that will go like this. And to do that, I'm going to use my router with a straight cutting bit and a fence. And I just have to take my time and remove a little bit of material with each pass. Okay, now I'm going to make the same pass down on the other end before I make any further adjustments. Okay, that takes care of the tongue. Now I want to put a groove in this breadboard piece that will slip over the tongue. But I don't want the groove to go all the way through the end of this breadboard piece. Notice that I've installed a piece of tape on the table to indicate where I want to let the piece down and remove it so that I'll end up with a half an inch of wood remaining so that that tongue won't show through. With a handsaw and a sharp chisel, I've made this little shoulder at the end of the table, and that's so I can slip that breadboard edge over. Now I'm just going to clamp it in place temporarily so that I can drill some holes. 
Now this is the underside of the table and I'm going to drill a 3 8 inch diameter but not quite all the way through for some dowels. Now I'm going to just pull out this doll I set in here to keep the holes aligned so I can take off this edge and I want to elongate the holes on each edge just in the tongue piece so that the top can expand and contract freely with changes of weather. The only glue I need on these dolls is the last eighth of an inch just to hold it in place and I'll just saw these off with my hand saw and now we're ready to start sanding this top. Okay, now I'm ready to round over the edges on my top. And for that I'm going to use a half inch rounding over bit. Notice that under the table, there are two cleats that have been screwed on, and they go on each side of the trestle to hold the top in place. And I'll make those from this stock right here. And the first thing I want to do is relieve these edges by using my bandsaw. Well, now I'll relieve these edges with my quarter inch rounding over bit in the router table. with the cleats fastened in place as well as the center brace I'm ready to see how well this top fits on top of the trestle. Now that seems to fit pretty good. Not bad for a rainy day. A few more hours of sanding on this table and it'll be ready for some kind of finish. One thing that was really nice about that pine table down in Nantucket was that dark, rich color. So to get the cherry a little darker, I'm going to put a cherry stain on it. I'll apply it with the brush as evenly as possible, let it sit for about 10 minutes, and then wipe off the excess. Well, depending on how much I rub this down will determine the final color that I end up with, and I think this is just about right. Well, what do you think? After the cherry stain dried, I put on two coats of satin finish urethane with a light sanding between each coat. And now this table is ready for many a grand meal. Thank you for watching. For more, please like and subscribe.